attendees to join us and we'll be live with Dave and Aaron from Destination Analysts very shortly. So just stand by. Thank you. Uh, and some insights and actionable recommendations for you today. Hello, my name is Chris Adams. I'm going to be facilitating the session today and then at the end sharing with you some additional resources and research. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Dave, if you could uh, progress the screen, please. Today is uh, we're in collaboration with uh, the Southeast Tourism Society, and I want to give a special shout out to Bill, Suzanne, Chuck, and the whole team there at SDS. They do some uh, fantastic uh, work, in particular their famed marketing college, which I've had the privilege to uh, speak at and attend for a number of years, um, and it's really one of the best educational opportunities around in the industry, so keep up the great work, guys. We've got um, some wonderful... Um, key points to cover today in terms of the travel intentions and media use of American travellers. Then we're taking a peek at some of the latest research from the new State of the International Traveller research that Dave and Aaron uh, have recently launched uh, and some exciting uh, insights in terms of the interest in travelling to the United States from international markets. We're going to be taking a deep dive after we have a quick look at um, some of those media use statistics into content and Dave and Aaron um, worked on a special custom report with us looking at destination content and the type of content that influences and impacts the decision on where to go. We've got some um, content examples and a whole range of additional resources for you to share and look at um, after the uh, webinar today, including an online gallery of some content examples we've pulled together from all over the world. Then we've got an opportunity for a Q&A at the end. So um, just a few little housekeeping issues in terms of using the webinar today. So you've got the little grab um, um, box, the little orange box in the top right there where you can close or open uh, the navigation. Uh, if you drop off for any reason, use the link to get back on. Uh, most importantly though, uh, please send your questions in using the question box there in the um, bottom of the navigation area and we hopefully we'll have some time at the end today to talk about uh, some of the specific, specific questions. So without further ado, let me introduce Dave Bratton and Aaron Francis Cummings, uh, the founders and <coughs> managing directors of Destination Analysts. Uh, we've worked with Dave and Aaron for many years and they've got uh, well, more than a dozen years now of working with destinations across the US and all over the world. Uh, they're going to be uh, presenting the State of the American Traveller. We've been fortunate to have been involved right from the start as a, as a key sponsor, and it really is one of the most important research investments we make. So, Dave and Aaron, over to you. Can you hear me okay, Chris? Yes, Dave. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and thanks everyone for being here today. We were looking at the attendee list and we have people from all over the country and uh, all different uh, sides of the tourism industry. So we're excited to share with you this information from the State of the American Traveler. Uh, some of you know about this study, but I'll give you a little background on it anyway. Uh, we conduct a national survey of American leisure travelers every six months with uh, Miles as our partner. Uh, we do this by sending out, using one of our uh, trusted sample providers, a invitation to a nationally representative sample of American adults. That is by geography, by demographic characteristics like income, age, gender, and the like. So that this invitation to take the survey lands in the, in the laps of a representative sample of American adults. And then um, if, if these people have taken at least one leisure trip 
of 50 miles or more one way from their home during the past year. We consider them travelers and they're allowed to take the survey. Uh, this, this wave we collected 3,000 uh, surveys from these travelers so we have a very large sample to work with here. The survey is a broad based one. It uh, examines traveler opinions on various topics, activities, motivations, their media use and, and as we talked about, as Chris talked about, content usage and desired content that they want to plan travel. So we're going to go through all that today, but one of the key reasons we uh, do this study is we want to track consumer sentiment around future travel. So we will have some a, a better feel for what the year is going to look like. And as you all know, this has been a, a interesting economic period since the crash in 2008, uh, to say the least. And we've been kind of in a sustained slog upward uh, or stable for a long time. Last year's economic outlook was. Uh, really pretty positive in a lot of ways, but in the early part of this year it's gone a bit wobbly. Um, the Ec Economist magazine referred to last year as magical for stocks uh, with GD pro GDP growth eng ending strong. You know, last year the S&P rose by 30 percent and Japan's Nikkei was up by almost 60 percent. Huge growth in wealth in uh, potential travelers around the globe. Um, however, this year that's turned around a lot and in fact the same economist story that I referred to earlier uh, estimated that three trillion dollars have been wiped off global asset sheets by the drop in stocks over the last six weeks. So that's bad news and, and obviously most of America has been in a deep freeze for the last, uh, the last month and that slowed things down quite a bit. So right now there's some guarded optimism about the year but uh, things I think most economists right now feel pretty good about the year and GDP pr predictions are around 3% growth which would be great uh, given where we've been at. And this survey shows a similar story. Uh, we see sustained strength and stability in consumer sentiment around travel. It's much better right now than it was post crash. It's very stable uh, but it's actually still somewhat less than what we saw back in the 2006 and 2007 period before all heck broke loose and uh, things fell apart. Uh, previous to um, the, um, the crash, uh, or excuse me, right after the crash, we had about 20% of people saying they were going to travel more. Now that's grown quite a bit and I'm going to show you that data in a minute. Um, but one of the first questions we ask is how many trips people take? You know, in the past year, how many, tri how many leisure trips have you taken? And over the last two periods, as you'll see on this chart, uh, the average American took 4.8 leisure trips unchanged um, over the last six months, but up a bit from a year ago in January, which is good news. When we look at that story I talked a little bit about before, whether people are going to travel more or less, uh, the story changes a bit though. Um, this is kind of one of our kind of flagship questions here where we ask people in the next 12 months, do you expect to travel more, less, or about the same as you did in the previous 12-month period? And the chart you see in front of you shows the proportions that said they were going to travel more, going to travel the same, and travel less in green, yellow, and orange, respectively. So if you look at the far right, we see that expectations are up from this summer. The last summer it was at 30.2% saying they were going to travel more. That's gone up by about two points to 32.3%, which is a, a cause for you know optimism that's good news but one of the things we see in this this uh, data all the time is that it tends to be seasonal that summertime numbers tend to dip and we see if we compare a year ago we're actually down very slightly in terms of the Amer proportion of Americans who want to uh, who expect to travel more in the upcoming year and last year by most measures was a good year for travel um, same thing for for spending let's just look at the flip side of the coin Each, how many people say they want to spend or they expect to spend more in the upcoming year. Uh, in this most recent wave in January, 32.5 percent said so. Uh, up a little bit from last summer, but again down from a year ago, very slightly. So as I said, what we see here in this is a very sustained pattern that seemed to develop here of strength and stability. And like I said, uh, these numbers, the 32.5 percent you see for January, immediately after the crash was about 20 percent and the same for the number of people who expect to travel more. If we look even further back before the, the crash, these numbers were up around 40% or, or in that ballpark. So we haven't quite caught up to where we were, but uh, things are looking you know, good or at least stable and strong for the, for the year to come. Um, 
Yeah, one of the Chris, things I can just ask a quick question there. Yes, um, Chris. In terms of um, um, the recovery, a lot of commentators have talked about how uneven it is and uh, yeah. the middle class is still under pressure. So what are you seeing in terms of if you segment out uh, those travel intentions by, say, income levels? Um, yeah, that certainly a lot, is... A lot greater strength. Uh, yeah, like that affluent, certainly uh, is, the, is the story, Chris, that you see in the news is the, the you know, the divide between you know rich and poor so to speak in, in America that seems to be being exacerbated but when we look at the the cross tabs here and, and compare affluent Americans to people who are of less affluence and I'm just using eighty thousand dollars of the annual household income as a breaking point uh, there's a big difference in enthusiasm between the two just for example with the uh, the stat on the percent that expect to travel more only about 30% of the less affluent uh, group expects to, where nearly 40% of affluent Americans expect to increase their travel in the coming year. Same thing for spending, about 30 to 40% uh, respectively. So yeah, the, the affluent side of our, our country is uh, feeling much more enthusiastic about it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some constraints to travel, and we'll see the, we see the same story with affluence there. Um, and one of the interesting things, we look at travel discounts and bargains and whether people expect to actively go after them and use them in their planning. And that, in that metric, there's very little difference between uh, the affluent Americans and, and less affluent Americans. And I, I'll show you that data in just a minute here. Uh, so let's look at this table I put up right now. And this, uh, this shows four of the metrics we track that we, we like to consider constraints to travel gasoline prices being too expensive, personal finances being in you know, some question, airfare being too expensive, or safety concerns. We track a bunch of stuff, but these are three of the, the key ones that we notice tend to impact how people's enthusiasm for travel um, goes up and down a great deal. So you see the red bar around gasoline prices being too expensive, and this has changed a lot over the last several years. In July 2011, half more than half of Americans felt that gas was keeping them keeping them at home, to some degree. Uh, this has fallen to 32.9 percent, which is great news for the industry. Uh, hopefully, it'll be sustained through the summer. That would be an awesome thing for us, because we know that about 80 percent of all travel is done by car. You know, car is king in the American travel industry, so uh, that's super important. Uh, a little bit of bad news here, kind of the wobbliness thing, maybe showing up. Uh, we look at personal financial reasons. We're much better than we were before. If you look back to 2010, where it was more than half, 56%, saying that their personal finances kept them at home more than they'd like to be, down to 41% this, this last wave, which is a good direction. But again, compared to last summer, and we've actually seen a little bit of an uptick there. Uh, with airfare, you know, airfare ten tends to follow gasoline prices too. It's, it's improved with fewer people being... Um, kept at home by high high airfare. And safety concerns seem to have uh, kind of moderated completely. They've almost gone away uh, from the post 9-11 you know, period where people were all concerned about safety. It's stabilized at about 1 in 10 Americans feeling it keeps them off the road. Um, one of the things that we, we've studied here too is people um, people's work keeping them from traveling. That is not a major uh, major constraint to travel as we see it. And, and that, that data is all available in the report if you'd like to look at it, which is free to the public. And uh, Chris will give you guys a link to that at the end of this, I believe. So one of the things that has been a hot topic around the industry for the last four or five years, and especially since the crash, has been this idea that a new normal has emerged where uh, travel product providers will have to constantly be pushing discounts to get anybody to buy their, their goods and services because people are always going to want discounts. And so we started tracking immediately after the, the collapse uh, in 2008 whether people felt they would be actively out looking for travel discounts and bargains in the next 12 months. And we've seen a consistent decline in this. And we've reported on this before, but I wanted to show you this again because in the most recent wave it dropped dramatically from half of Americans saying that these deals and discounts would be something they'd be actively looking for down to 43% in, uh, in a, a few weeks ago when we took this survey. So uh, that's good news too that uh, suggests people are, are you know, feeling a little better about their pocketbooks perhaps on, on some level 
that they'll be willing to travel without uh, without these deals and discounts. Aaron is going to talk a bit about those in, in a moment, but uh, I don't mean to diminish the importance of deals and discounts to travelers because obviously a lot of people look for them, but as a, a sign of a macro shift in how people think about travel, I think this is good news for the industry. Now, Chris mentioned that we are doing a new survey. We call it the State of the International Traveler. And I want to share some data with you from this study to show you where America sits in terms of our enthusiasm for travel. Uh, kind of give all of this stuff I've talked about a little uh, perspective. And I, I hope that this will help you to understand, uh, get a better picture of, of international travel and Amer where America sits in it as well. We started this survey uh, this last, this year, and collected the data in December. We went out and collected a uh, representative sample in 12 of America's largest feeder markets of what we call internationally oriented adult travelers, 800 in each market, uh, 10,000 through 239 total surveys from these 12 countries. And these are people who are likely to travel abroad uh, within the next three years. So we wanted to talk to people who were of a mindset that they were interested in going outside their home country and see how they think about America and all sorts of different uh, topics. Um, so let's just look at a few of the questions here. And these questions were asked in the, the front of the survey questionnaire, identically to the State of the American Traveler data that I already showed you. And the question you see in front of you is, sim is, is identical to the one we talked about before. In the next 12 months, do you expect to take more, fewer, the same number of domestic leisure trips than you did in the most recent 12-month period? So for each country, we see the proportion of these internationally oriented travelers who are going to be, they, they expect to be traveling more at home. For example, 71% of Brazilians think they're going to be taking more trips around their home country in the upcoming year. Uh, Mexico, China, India, South Korea, all very strong. The established markets in Europe, much weaker. Uh, nearly, you know, uh, half as many uh, travelers in those markets feel they're going to be traveling more at home. Now remember, we talked about this for America at 32.3% in the most recent wave. These surveys were conducted nearly in an identical time frame. So we see that America is near the top of the established markets here, well below the emerging markets in terms of you know, intent to travel at home. And same thing for spending. We ask about spending as well. Do you expect to spend more for domestic leisure travel? Same story. India, China, high expectations for spending at home, Brazil, South Korea, Mexico as well. America falls in uh, just a half a point, half a percentage point behind our Aussie friends there uh, with 33% of Australians thinking they're going to travel more around Australia. So our enthusiasm is good for, uh, for the established markets and well behind the, uh, the internet, the uh, emerging markets. Now, we take this another step further with the international survey and we ask about travel, travel abroad. Are you expecting to travel more, less, or the same? And a very similar story emerges. The chart I've just put up shows the proportion in each country that expect to travel more internationally in the next year. Two, three out of four Chinese, almost you know, 77% of Chinese say they're going to be going abroad more than they did last year in the upcoming year. Brazil, Mexico, India again. So we see a great uh, strong you know, expectation in these markets to be going outside their home countries, uh, which is fabulous for America. Uh, last year, as you guys probably know, we, we had something like 69 million visitors from abroad, and that's expected to grow uh, dramatically over the next uh, four years up to, I, I, you know, I believe the estimates are around 84 million uh, international rivals to the U.S. So this is it show, this kind of shows an interesting picture of, of uh, how the emerging markets are, are looking at their travel futures. Same thing for spending. 75% uh, of Chinese expect to spend more on international travel. India, Brazil, South Korea, and Mexico as well all are up there. Uh, one of the things I'll tell you, which we're not going to go into today, but we, we follow this, these questions up with a open-ended question asking where you most want to go, what countries do you want to visit. So, I mean, it's great if China wants to travel more, but are they interested in America? So this was, as I said, an open-ended question with no help from us. Just write in the places you want to go most. And 
America came in first place in nine of 12 of these markets, which is great news for us in terms of where they want to go. Not only are they, they gung-ho to travel, they're gung-ho to come to the U.S. The three countries where we weren't number one were European markets, so we may have some, uh, some issues there that uh, need to be dealt with. Um, so one last slide, and I'm going to hand this over to my partner, Aaron, who will talk about the content side of this data. And, and the final slide shows the kind of a, a sense of spending that these countries hold for international travel. The question read, thinking carefully about how you expect to spend your income in the next 12 months, please use the scale below to describe your spending priorities. And the two bars you see here show extremely high priority and high priority. Uh, so we see again that India, China, Brazil, Germany, Germany pops up pretty well here. It's, the, it's a source of uh, optimism for Europe, but the three biggies in the emerging markets are, are the ones that, are, that have the highest expectations for you know, devoting their disposable income to international travel. So um, good news uh, abroad. Well, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to highlight, we're going to be talking about content a little later, and you can see here the strength of the emerging and developing markets, which um, you know, are estimated to make up the vast majority, like 98% of the growth over the next um, decade or more as we move from about 1 billion international visitor arrivals globally to um, more than 2 billion. So um, talking about content, obviously the importance of having uh, content that's appropriate for these emerging markets is, is critically important. That's right. Um, this is Erin now. Hello, everybody. I'm going to move back into the U.S. and back to State of the American Traveler and share with you some of the um, insights from this most recent survey, um, which we hope will help you all market better to travelers. So um, a big question that we hear out amongst our industry peers is how and when are people accessing our travel content? So. Um, one of the questions we asked on this wave of the survey is to ask our survey respondents um, to estimate what percentage of their travel planning they typically did on their laptop or desktop computer, their smartphone, their tablet, and then through printed materials um, before they left for their trip. So the, the chart you're seeing here is their estimated, the estimated percent of this travel plan they did before they leave their trip. For on their trip. And we see that um, traditional computing devices like laptop or desktop, so 70% of travel planning is done on those. And about 15% before they leave for the trip is done on a, on a mobile, um, some sort of mobile device like a tablet or uh, smartphone. Um, in conducting a lot of qualitative research of travelers, um, I had the opportunity to look into why this is, why there's still so much so heavy of a proportion of travel planning is done um, before leaving on a trip on that traditional device. And um, what, I've, what I've mainly heard is that um, they still need the larger screen. Um, you know, uh, travelers are, are, can be, um, they have their, their ways of doing things and they want their multiple tabs up. A lot of them still take notes while they're travel planning. Um, using websites, um, and so they really just prefer, and, and I saw this across the board, millennials as well, that they just prefer to have the larger screen um, that's offered by their laptop or desktop computer. So when we look at what percentage is done on these devices once they're on their trip, um, we see the um, relative of, of um, importance of laptop or desktops um, decrease. Um, we see uh, more mobile usage, smartphones and tablets. That shoots up to about 28 um, percent of travel of their travel planning is done on a mobile device once they're in market. Um, but I wanted to point out that print comes up to 24.6 percent um, in market. Um, so about a quarter of their travel planning in market is done using printed materials. So those are things like your in market um, visitor guides, your travel brochures, and things. Um, those rise up in importance once in market. Those of you that have been following the State of the American Traveler uh, for a while are probably uh, intimately familiar with this chart. We've had it a while. This is our technologies, resources, and services used to plan leisure travel chart. And I'm going to walk you through it as we did last time from, from the top left down through the bottom. 
Um, so these are the, we track a number of resources as you see here and, and what people are using for planning travel. So let's start with user generated content here on the left. 43.7% of American leisure travelers said they use some form of user generated content, um, which we recognize is, is also social, but we like to call out the specific social resources separately. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here that um, I found very interesting is we used to always see um, user generated reviews of hotels um, exceed um, the the percent of people using user-generated reviews of hotels would always exceed user-generated reviews of other things, um, but we see that um, reviews of destinations, reviews of restaurants and activities, those are all at the same level um, as hotels now. So people are using um, user-generated content just across the board for travel planning. Um, over here on social, we really, um, of course, see the maturity of Facebook as a marketing resource. 29.3% of American leisure travelers said they used Facebook um, to plan leisure travel in the last year. 12.2% of them said they actually started following a destination through social media um, in order to plan a trip. Um, we look specifically at Twitter. 7.5% um, said they followed a destination on Twitter to plan a trip. And overall Twitter usage for, um, for specifically for travel planning was at 10.7%. 10, 10 Dave touched on um, you know, the use of uh, people actively seeking discounts. Um, and we saw the decline in that, which is, of course, a sign of um, uh, optimism in a good economy. Um, and the, you know, as he mentioned, people still, you can't take away the appeal of a great discount. Um, so you see 26.3% of people said they used a group discount website like Groupon or Living Social to actually plan leisure travel um, in the last year. Um, and in our focus groups of travelers, um, this doesn't surprise me because I definitely had at least one in four people in the recent focus groups that we've done, uh, you know, just organically bring up Groupon is um, something that they turn to and that once they know that they're going to a certain city, they'll actually look at that city's um, Groupon and see what um, offers are available there. And um, I also wanted to highlight that because um, in the usability of DM, uh, research we've done of DMO websites, I often talk to people who specifically ask for Groupon type content on DMO websites. So it's something to think about about maybe partnerships with these, these companies. Um, DMO websites, um, again, holding steady, about a third of American leisure travelers continue to use DMO uh, websites uh, to plan leisure travel. Um, and I have to remind everyone that we know that travelers don't know what a DMO is. The question was not um, positioned to them as DMO. Um, they were asked if they used an official tourism website or um, state or um, national tourism office website to plan travel. Um, mobile, 45% um, of American leisure travelers said they use content on their mob uh, mobile device to plan leisure travel. Um, and I will get into how that's grown over time after we get through this chart. Um, mapping, I wanted to call out mapping, 47.9% of American leisure travelers said they used a mapping website to plan travel. That's another area in the usability research that we do that we see that people often forget um, how critical mapping really is to trip planning. Um, so keep that in mind in, in your, in your um, digital content marketing. Um, opinions of uh, friends, colleagues, relatives, 42.6% said they used that to specifically plan leisure travel. Um, a question we asked in the survey, which we don't share in the report, um, but I, I touch on a bit of this series of questions a little bit later on. But we asked um, what resources people used um, in getting their inspiration for their last leisure trip. Um, and we got a little bit more detail on the opinions of friends and relatives. Um, so I just want to share with you that in, for their last leisure trips, um, people who used the opinions of friends and relatives, 74.6% of them said they got that feedback directly face to face. And 18% of them said they got it through Facebook, through reaching out on Facebook, um, and 15% um, through reaching out through Twitter. 27.2% um, just directly um, emailed a friend or relative. So still so doing traditional things like email um, and direct face-to-face -face contact, but also you see the importance of social there as well in seeking that, um, those opinions. And then 45.1% used some sort of print resource to plan leisure travel um, in the last year. So print, um, we see, we've, we've found print to really, um, the use of print to really be a function of the economy. Um, many print resources like travel magazines cost money, um, and so when the economy is not as strong, we see the use of those print resources drop. Um, as Dave shared, um, things are um, 
looking, feeling stable right now. And so we've seen print, the use of print resources grow to 45.1 percent. We look specifically, more specifically, at what print resources travelers are using. Um, we see travel and lifestyle magazines there at 17.4 percent, direct mail pieces 15.7, newspaper travel sections 14.1, uh, DMO print guides at 12.5 percent, and uh, St. Botsy Mobile's commercial guidebooks like um, Frommer's at 12.2 percent. Um, we've seen in the ad effectiveness and um, studies that we've done that um, print also seems to enjoy, you know, in terms of travel advertising, um, pretty strong recall rates. Um, and also reference back that to that question about inspiration that I just shared. I um, also saw travel lifestyle magazines be, um, you know, a, as a resource people look to for inspiration. It was one of the top ones too, um, in terms of that insp and that inspiration period. Um, when we look at how people, um, the percent of people consuming content through print and through mobile, we see that mobile, you know, I share with you that it's, it's grown. We see um, how much it's grown. It's now um, the percent of American travelers consuming content on mobile and print is at the same level. If we look at the use of DMO resources, their websites um, and their printed publications, um, this is the same story if you were on our webinar six months ago and um, we see continued um, a steady rate of continued use of DMO websites and their um, print guides. Uh, how are people using DMO print publications? We wanted to look a little a bit deeper at this because most DMOs that we've um, that we work with um, offer their visitors guide uh, not only a printed version but a digital version. Um, so we, this chart shows the percent of people who um, used a, just a digital version of the guide, just a printed version of the guide, or both. And we see that um, digital only usage um, slightly edges print only usage. 9.1% uh, said they just use the digital version of that. Uh, visitor's guide. And then um, let's look more specifically at these people who are using DMO websites. So as I um, shared with you, uh, one out of three American leisure travelers have used a DMO website in the past year. Um, and a question that we hear all the time at um, our in, in industry functions is that there's this struggle between uh, our as a DMO, are you there? Is your website there to inspire, or are you there to be a trip planning tool? So we wanted to ask these people when when they're using the DMO website and how um, to try to help um, get some understanding and insights around that struggle. So what we found was that six out of ten DMO website users used that website before they had selected the destination. So sixty percent going to that website to get inspiration, to get understanding of the destination, to make the decision. One out of two, 50% use the website after selecting the destination to be a trip, trip planning tool. And one out of 10 use them while actually in the destination. So um, the story here is really um, that there is, a, there, is, there is a real balance that you have to strike um, if you are a DMO. You, there, many people are coming to you specifically to con have you convince that, them to come to your destination. And then a lot of your audience is there for you to serve for them as a trip planning resource. And then with um, only about 10% using DMO websites while in market, there are certainly opportunities around that, which I'm sure Chris, Chris will touch on at the, at the end of our presentation here. So, Erin, in terms of yes. uh, the major reason why people don't go to destination websites, I know your past research has illustrated that the primary and overwhelming reason for that is they simply just don't know about it. Yes, that's correct. Um, we and you know we sh we shared with that the last um, the last webinar that yes, the number one impediment that we've seen in the many years asking questions about DMO websites is that people just don't know about them and don't just don't they just don't come top top of mind. Um, and thank you for asking that, Chris, because that's a good segue into this um, next um, set of data that I'm sharing with you now. Um, we wanted to um, we wanted to learn more about what travelers thought about um, the content that DMOs offer 
to travelers. Um, and so we asked a, a, a set of questions about you know, their opinions of DMO content. Um, so there's some good news here on the left. 70% of American travelers said content that comes from DMOs um, is trustworthy or very trustworthy. 70% said it's always or usually up to date. 70% said that DMO content is either easy or very easy to use. 60% um, feel that content from DMOs is usually important or very important to their planning. Um, but the opportunity here is that 40, only 40% 40 felt that DMO content is either always or usually innovative or cutting edge. Um, in the, we recently did a lot of research about millennials, and we found um, this uh, this point here be particularly this attitude be particularly strong amongst them that they're not that DMOs don't offer them innovative or cutting edge type of content um, and actually just wrapping up usability study for a, a, another U.S. Um, city recently and I had someone say you know while she used DMO websites regularly she said they they never she's like they never focus on the fun. They're, they're always wanting to show me dry and boring, but you know, fun, for fun, for the fun about a place, I have to look somewhere else. I think there's a real opportunity there in the content that you put out to to, to travelers and how you do it if you are a DMO. So to that end, Erin, we've put together, and I'll share this resource at the end, we've put together a gallery of um, some case study examples from all over the world of some compelling, impactful, and hopefully fun content, both. Um, in terms of uh, digital and print, so um, look out for that resource at the end. Okay, perfect, great. Um, so we, as I alluded to earlier, we asked a series of questions about um, their travelers' most recent leisure trip um, in which they had major travel planning responsibilities. Um, and, and this just, just highlights again, you know, if you are a DMO, the really the amazing opportunity that your your website and your digital assets have in, in convincing someone to come to your destination. Um, so you see this chart here, we asked them the number of destinations they were con actively considering um, when they were thinking of this most recent leisure trip. We said 40% of people had mo multiple destinations in mind when they were planning their last leisure trip. Um, and you know, I just shared with you that six and ten use DML websites before they've made that decision. Um, so I, I, I hope that data gives you the ammunition you need to make sure that your websites and your other digital marketing assets are really um, inspiring in terms of convincing people to come to your destination. And then we wanted to look into what types of content are, are really what is closing that sale for people. Um, so this is the, the top ten most impactful content types um, for, uh, that, are, that travelers say are most important to them in helping them decide to visit a destination. And you see that things to see and do, 53.5% of them said that was top, they, top content they access that makes them decide to visit a destination. Um, and if you talk to travelers and talk to any of your customers, um, this really clearly, you really clearly see that this is the case. I and mean, they want to know why they want you to tell them what is unique about your destination front and center. What is unique? What can they get there that they can't get anywhere else? What there is to do that needs to be top top things shown to them, things to see and do in your destination. Um, and then um, uh, I wanted to point out restaurants and dining because, I, again, I see this is an area of opportunity for a lot of DMOs. Um, you know, I, I talk to hundreds of travelers a year, um, and when I talk to them about traveling to destinations, one of the first things out of their mouth is about food and the food that they can get and, and the, the cuisine that they might be able to experience um, in traveling. Um, and so we see that restaurants and dining came up as the fourth most important content in making that destination decision. I think that's an area where, um, and there are certainly DMOs um, that are doing a really great job of that. I think it's an opportunity for all DMOs um, uh, in their um, content marketing to really highlight um, the, the culinary opportunities available in their destination. Again, it's very top of mind for travelers. Um, and clearly here in the data we see it's one of the most important things they consider in making that destination decision. Another area of, of 
I, th I would say critical um, need and not just opportunity um, is, is costs. Um, hotel costs, costs of getting there, discounts and deals we see are uh, really important um, to travelers in, in that destination decision. And I, when I have written reports on um, the usability of DMO websites, I, I don't think there's a single one where I haven't had to say you're missing, travelers are saying you're missing your your sites are missing cost information um, and I understand having worked in a DMO there's a lot of political reasons around that but it's it's very critical to get past that um, it's how people are making just decisions to come to your destination they need to be able to have an understanding of costs um, it, how much a hotel costs how much an attraction costs some type of set, costing sense for them it needs to be communicated so to wrap up, um, we have, in terms of travel expectation, there's sustained optimism um, domestically for um, traveling and uh, number of trips and spending. Um, the America is um, a hot destination um, uh, for amongst the emerging markets, um, and emerging markets in general show great, great promise for travel and travel spending. Um, and uh, tra as I just shared with you, travelers continue to use a complex range of media and diverse resources for travel information. Um, some ideas for you to take away. Um, DM as a DMO, you're, you're really at a great place in terms of inspiring people um, to come to your destination, the content that you put out there. But you have to show your story, your unique story, and what are the compelling things there are to do in your destination. Um, and also to really be a, six, a success as a resource for travelers, you cannot ignore um, cost, um, the information around cost. Um, DMOs media penetration continues to hold content co uh, constant. Um, we still face the same issues as last time: the low levels of awareness. Um, but great, uh, an issue that can be overcome um, is uh, the modernity of your content um, and really um, getting it to a level that people see as progressive and cutting edge. And if uh, there are any questions, or if you'd like to make any comments, um, we're happy to take them. Just use the question box, as we're showing here. So we'll come to those in a moment, Erin, uh, in terms of questions. We've already got uh, quite a few. Um, let's just move on to the next slide in terms of uh, some of the key takeaways that we highlighted. Uh, we've already talked about um, the opportunity to particularly to target affluent, affluent Americans. Uh, we're seeing that in a range of um, you know, sectors of the economy. And I know this is a phenomenon very much in the restaurant business, for example. So obviously revisiting you know, the opportunity to build and remarket to um, the more affluent American travelers and working with key industry partners in that area. Uh, international, I suppose a key opportunity there is investing in uh, content, native language content, and as many of you know, we work very closely with Brand USA, and there's co-op opportunities there to actually subsidise the development of both online video, editorial, and slide content for um, international markets, and, and particularly important in these emerging markets. Um, and then I suppose this mobile and print intersection, you know, provides us with an opportunity just to rethink about print. We still see its critical importance, but um, certainly in terms of revisiting uh, its in-market versus out-of-market use and the importance, for example, still much, very much at the motivational stage. And then content, uh, I referenced before, we've got a number of resources around content inspiration and ideas. So. Uh, just moving on to those additional resources that we've got. Um, so you can visit our Miles website. Um, there's a blog that we've just posted on that content. You can click through to the uh, gallery. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, we've got a whole library of resources, and of course you'll be able to see a recorded version of this webinar as well. Um, one of our first questions was, where do I get hold of the State of the American Traveler Research? So if you move on to the next slide, Erin. Um, we've got that available on our website in the library area, so you can download the six-page report. Um, and I know destination analysts also have it available on their website as well. <coughs> Let's um, just jump into a couple of questions. Um, first one was regarding uh, content. So. Um, 
uh, events didn't seem to be, to be on the list, Dave or Aaron. What, uh, what was your take on events, and did that appear somewhere else? Uh, in terms of inspiration, um, right, um, it's, um, I'll just share with you what we've seen on the qualitative side interviewing, um, interviewing so many travelers. Um, certainly, and I think if you're a demo, you see this in your analytics, um, events are um, really popular content um, on DMO websites, and I, and I see people actually, you know, see that as a strength, I, you know, just organically bring that up, that that's a um, content that they seek on DMO websites, but um, it's interesting in terms of inspiration, um, when I interview people who are just in that inspiration phase, um, some, it's, it's not, it's not, it's certainly not universal. There are just some people that will look at events content in that, in that stage, and it's more wrapped in their mind as part of the things to see and do in that destination. Um, and if something catches their eye, they may consider, you know, a trip, trip, trip around it, but it's, um, it just generally, I mean, obviously there are some some events that people go specifically to places for, but generally it's more just wrapped up in what's unique about the destination. What does the, um, you know, what do they have there that's unique? Is this event unique to them? Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah, sure. And and I think um, you know amongst that segment of uh, travellers who are specifically going for an event, and that's obviously can be critically important where you've got marquee or iconic events. Um, then obviously event content is going to be critically important for them. Um, our good friend Justin in Denver was just asking, um, um, on the slide where we were looking at technology and media resources that travellers used, um, are you surprised, Aaron or Dave, at the use of um, smartphones during a trip is relatively low, or at least uh, that's Justin's take on the stats? Um, that was, um, make sure that was clear. I, I'm, I don't know if you're referring to the percent, um, there, cause there was a chart per, comparing percentage, um, versus like desktop and printed. So that's the, yeah, the overall. The, um, pie chart where you were right. you know, sharing so travelers... the resources both before and during the trip. Yeah. So that's the, the percentage of their trip planning that they did on each of those devices. Um, so they may have done quite a bit on their mobile phone, but in, in, the, in terms of the overall um, proportion of all the trip planning they were doing in market, um, you know, uh, the part that was done mobily was 30%. Um, yeah. And I, I so suppose... Uh, it doesn't speak to the volume, it's just the proportion. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. We, we did a big study, didn't we, or a custom report on uh, different age groups and millennials, and so presumably the usage of smartphones is going to be much higher amongst millennials. I think that was highlighted in your July State of the American Traveler research. That's correct. Um, and, and Justin, we um, have, um, I can look at that data for you by millennials as well if you're interested in seeing that. Um, also, I want to, just so you know, um, trip planning in market just overall goes down versus pre-trip. Um, we always see that in our um, in-market visitor surveys and people are just doing less, just less overall trip planning type of tasks. Um, but again, I just want to make sure you know that that, that chart was just the percent done on that device. Um, it, do, it doesn't speak to the, the amount of um, content they're consuming mobily once in market, which could be yeah. significant. Uh, we've had several questions again about where to get hold of the research, so just to remind everybody if you go to milespartnership.com, click on the uh, insights and then the library area that uh, it's available there and you'll also be able to download the July 2013 edition which included that custom report on uh, different uh, age groups, different generations of American travelers and how they use um, both technology and media in different ways and there were some great insights from that as well. Uh, you can also obviously download download a variety of our other white papers um, from there as well. Um, we've had um, McLaren Larder was just asking to confirm whether the research came um, on the use of DMO websites came from the January 2014 edition of the State of the American Traveler. So in fact, all the key information presented today was from that January 2014 edition. Um, do you want to just move on to the other slides while we just 
collate these other questions and we'll just uh, remind people about those white papers. So a couple we wanted to highlight in particular, Responsive Design is a great website, uh, white paper there on uh, your design and content uh, planning implications uh, as you look ahead for a responsive or adaptive uh, website. And in addition, um, we've just launched last week um, marketing and advertising uh, ROI. So basically, how do you measure the effectiveness and return on investment of your different marketing and advertising? So this looks at using Google Analytics in simple and powerful ways, trackable phone numbers, and then analyzing the ROI of different marketing channels. So there's, that's another great resource available on our uh, website as well. Um, We've got a question from Mandy Golden, Aaron and Dave. How important uh, is video on a DMO website? I think you briefly touched on it, but uh, do you have any uh, key insights there from past research? Yes, and um, fortunately, um, thanks um, to our partnership with Miles, we've just recently done a number of um, usability studies on DMO websites, and video um, is I mean, I, I've had to write that as a recommendation in, in a lot of recent reports. Um, it's cert I think DMO websites, and you know, you brought, Chris, you brought up millennials, and what we looked at um, millennials last year, and I, I saw this in interviewing so many of them recently. Um, DMO websites are really underserving the millennials' desire for video. Um, that is a, one of the you know first things that I see them looking for. Um, because they're so used to having that type of content available. Um, so certainly amongst that generation, um, which is, um, <laughs> Dave and I always think they're the most sophisticated generation of travelers, shockingly sophisticated. Um, so yes, video content is very important for them, something that they Yes, are, and in fact we've got several respondents in their questions that were um, suggesting that um, you know the lack of um, commitment around uh, a feeling that DMOs are cutting edge or leading in their content was really an issue of uh, a lack of video content. That's so right, and also video and rich media are important. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up too in, term, um, in terms of the cutting edge thing because, um, you know, something I'll share with you too, I, I mean, sometimes when a millennials look at video on a DMO website, um, they'll, they'll, you know, just assume that it's going to be this very um, corporate um, travel brochure, they'll say travel brochure like video. Um, so they love when when you surprise them and it's and it's real and um, it feels like um, it's someone that's an expert in the destination that's teaching them something or um, it gives them the feeling of being there. Um, so I would really consider consider that in, in your in your the video content that you put out there. So um, just a final uh, question or two. David Adelman actually picked up on that point, uh, Aaron, talking about the importance of photos and videos, uh, particularly in terms of influencing friends' travel decisions. And I, I think it's true to say, isn't it, that, that Facebook statistic, which I think is about 29% of people saying they reference uh, Facebook, that is very significantly is people viewing uh, photo images shared by friends on trips. and so. You know the importance of imagery in social media is critical. Is critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just on um, Facebook and and that point, I I hear almost verbatim from people like I don't use Facebook as a search engine. Like they'll say some version of that. Um, what they're they're looking at Facebook for is to get that content from their friends and relatives to see those photos of trips, um, and then you know other companies that they may share like. They're not um, you, like again. They're not. They don't feel like they're using it as a search engine, but just a, a way to, to get content and get inspired. Yeah, great. And so, just a final question from uh, Jeanette: uh, Will we be sharing the slide deck? Well, we're certainly sharing a, um, a recording of the webinar, and uh, we can certainly load a PDF of the slide deck as well. So. Um, up on the screen are the various events that um, Miles Destination Analysts will be at over the coming months. So uh, many of you I know will be going to one or more of these events, so we really look forward to catching up with you in person. Um, and thank you so much for your time today in terms of coming together. Um, and
and uh, and sharing um, and allowing us to share this the information and insights. So please visit the Miles Partnership website for all the resources we talked about today, including uh, to download a copy of that State of the American Travel Research and to visit the online gallery of content, ideas, and inspiration. Our contact details are up here. So please reach out to us at any time. And um, Dave and Erin, a special thanks to you. And a special thanks to STS. Uh, and thank you so much for all the work you guys do. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. And um, have a great day. And uh, look forward to connecting with you guys in the future.